very, very good evening to everybody for joining us on this Saturday evening. Uh, so the connect Flame University's liberal education philosophy pretty much strives to make a uh, connection between various disciplines. And uh, uh, in this time of uncertainty, we needed to be equipped with, uh, uh, you know, uh, a way where we could probably, uh, you know, share the right kind of knowledge and tools to be able to deal with, you know, the changes that probably the COVID got in. And looking at the situation from various perspectives, anyways, betters uh, one's ability to find optimal solution. With this in view, and uh, we did customize uh, an online lecture series uh, with the help of our very respected uh, thought leaders, Connections, a webinar series that helps you to discover the value of interdisciplinary thinking in the post-COVID world. And these sessions are free and open to all those who wish to learn from uh, uh, the speakers uh, who join us every uh, fortnight. This session is going to be emphasizing on essential sk life skills to succeed. I know it's a very uh, talked about and cliche sort of a uh, topic when we look, uh, look at it. But uh, if you actually uh, you know, see that the importance of life skills, I think, is very, very important. It can change people's experiences. And today we have uh, mm -hmm. Professor Pritha Menon. Uh, who's uh, the faculty of communication at Flame. Uh, she's, uh, 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 she's the associate professor of advertising and branding at Flame University and holds a doctorate degree in management studies from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. She also holds an MMS degree uh, in marketing from University of Mumbai, PGD in advertising and marketing from Xavier's Institute of Communication. Uh, Preetha's current uh, research includes consumer neuroscience and experimental research on advertising and branding topics. And we have a lot of introduction for her, but uh, keeping it uh, uh, sweet and small, uh, a very, very warm welcome, uh, Preetha and uh, uh, Preetha ma'am, and uh, we'd like you to please begin with your session. Thank you so much, Anju. <laughs> and uh, without further ado, a very warm welcome to everybody who is uh, coming on a Saturday evening. Um, I'm sure that you know all of you who have joined in are here to take tidbits of some uh, life skills that you may want to use going forward. And um, my talk today is going to be primarily based on my own experiences. And then a little bit from what I have learned as a professional with other experts uh, coming in. So these are personal stories as well as things that seem to work when we uh, have tried it out in the market. So um, I'm going to share my slide right now and then I'm also going to give you a background of um, at the same time of what this talk is about, right? Um, Is the slide visible? Yes. 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 So, um, you know, essential life skills to succeed is the topic. So let's start with some key words here and talk about what we mean by success. Uh, so most of the times, I mean, <laughs> some of the fault is with media that I come from also, is that success is always, uh, you know, the stories that are celebrated are always these rags to riches stories. So people from the rural areas, people with limited resources, uh, with scarce access to, um, you know, uh, technology or money and all of that, when they do well, there is a story. Yeah. Uh, when um, a school dropout becomes the CEO of large uh, tech firm, then that becomes a story. Software firm becomes a story. When somebody in a, a woman in a rural area becomes an Olympian, uh, then that becomes a story. So uh, how we measure success yeah, has been such that unless we have this sort of a rags to riches story, uh, you, nobody seems to celebrate it. But I'm coming from an era, and I'm guessing that most of you are too, from an era and from a situation where we are not underprivileged. We are the privileged. We have access to the best resources. We have gone to great schools and colleges, been taught by great professors, um, have had um, 
you know, a plan in our lives, being able to manage this plan. So in a sense, what I would call privileged, yeah? And in um, when you talk about the underprivileged and the privileged, everybody, including the privileged, as well as the underprivileged, know how we should react to the privileged, uh, to the underprivileged, yeah? So uh, you know that there is somebody who's underprivileged, so you have to be sympathetic for sure. Uh, if it's possible, put yourself in their shoes and be empathetic as well. And we know that, you know, you, you should celebrate. But when somebody is already privileged, you say, oh, you know, you have uh, things like there is this discussion in the movie industry, right? Where they're talking about parents giving their kids jobs or we're talking about um, in, in the case of education right now, where you say you have the best education, you're coming from the best institutes. It's happened to me. I come from IIT. I usually have some scones uh, around me saying, you know, there are some people who, who say good, great, but there are many people who say, oh, what IIT, you know? And uh, IIT is all like a bubble and uh, there's uh, it's so restricted, everybody doesn't have access to it. So there's some sort of, a, um, you know, um, resistance to you even before you enter. And this happens to a lot of privileged people. You say, oh, you've come with a silver spoon in your uh, mouth, you know, so why should you, uh, crib about anything. You should you should take everything uh, in your stride, but that's not true. Yeah, there has to be a story around the success based on the hard work that even the privileged people put, and this story can be made by um, you know people like you and me who are living in the current era, who are living in um, metros, who are living in cities at least, who have access to resources and who can still do well in life. So I'm just setting the context for what success could mean. The second thing that I'm going to put to you is life skill. You know, what is the difference between a technical or a functional skill and a life skill? Is that in a technical or a functional skill, you, know, you become good at a particular job. You're able to do a job well. But if you have to stay around and if you have to continue to do well, then you need a life skill. It's something like that. Yeah, so I'm going to focus today and somewhere we will talk about the skills that you will need as in it's a life skill that converts itself into other kinds of functional and technical skills. But we will talk about that as well. Uh, what are the kind of uh, life skills you need to improve your technical skills? But this is somewhat the context. Yeah? And why I'm telling you all this is because according to two of the largest organizations who do this on a regular basis, um, the life skills or the top 10 skills, the top 10 skills in all, so this is not life skills at all, it's the top 10 skills in all, according to Forbes and the World Economic Forum, if you look at them, most of them are life skills. And the top four are definitely life skills. Yeah, somewhere at the bottom, it talks about thriving in a virtual environment, which is about how you up your technical skills. But most of it is around that. But in 2015, you would see more functional skills. For example, quality control is a functional skill. Service orientation is a functional skill. Um, Yes, I think that's about it. Most of the others are still, um, you know, life skills. So what this really means is that irrespective of how strong you are in your technical arena, without life skills, you are not only not able to function at a workplace, you're not able to function in your social setting as well. Yeah, so this is where it's coming from. Um, if I have I to- I think you, you really set the context so beautifully because when we think about life skill, we, we, we don't have this clarity of like, you know, it's very uh, intangible sort of a uh, thought that comes to your mind that what are life skills. But I think the way you picked out the difference between skills and life, life skills and what success, you've really set up a very lovely context, uh, uh, Professor Pritha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's this is active feedback. I love it. So there is a chat box. Uh, sorry, there's a Q&A box there uh, that I think all of you can start dropping in your questions there. We will take questions at regular intervals. Uh, I don't mean to take questions right at the end. I want it to be interactive. I want us to be talking to each other. And uh, just to test if it's working, uh, let's find out a little bit more about all of you. Can you drop in, in the... Uh, 
Q&A box, your age group. I just want to know this primarily because we are, um, I want to know at what career stage you are in. Uh, while this talk is good for anybody, it is best for people who are at a career inflection point. Now, what I mean by a career inflection point is that let's say you're moving from, um, you know, school education, high school education into um, university education. So you're moving from 12th standard to maybe level to, you know, first year of your degree college. That is a movement from where you are in a very protected, you know, environment to you're moving to something very unfamiliar or you're moving from college to a new job, which means you're looking at a new job itself. Uh, the third kind of career inflection point would be where you're trying to switch careers. Maybe you have been in the industry, there has been a burnout and you say that I want to move from this to something that is more fulfilling, that has work-life balance. And therefore there is an inflection point. You're moving from what you're so this is basically to understand whether you're moving from something that you are familiar with to a situation where uh, you know there's some other thing that you're not familiar with. Yeah. So moving from familiar to unfamiliar, and uh, so if you can put down your age and if you're at any career inflection point, that would be good. Okay. So we have a few young participants. Right, nice, nice. So this is so I understand, you know, the group that I'm talking to, and I can um, really tell you what wo would work for you best. Right. Okay, so um, I have a fair idea now. So I'm talking to you know young people moving from uh, schools, colleges to a university life. You're mo either you're moving there or you're moving just from there to your first kind of internship or your first experience with the workplace. This is the kind of, uh, uh, you know, audience I have and I'm talking to based on the answers I've got. I've got just a few, but uh, yes. So I'm going to, going to kind of focus on you people who have, um, you know, participated by telling me your age groups and um, I'm guessing what your career inflection point will be. Okay, so uh, going forward, so that's one thing. That what are we talking about? I, I already mentioned what we are talking about. Now it is about who am I talking to? I'm talking to uh, students primarily who are looking at moving from something that they're very familiar with, their schools, colleges, where there's a strict uh, curriculum to now something as liberal as liberal education at Flame University and so many others, where they give you so many options, the options are limitless. And um, when you have this, suddenly you're given so many options, then choice making becomes so difficult. Yeah. So uh, there are some skills that you need for this, for how you can make the right choices. But at the same time, um, you know, we are looking at also other things like you're going to suddenly be in a group of a group of people that you have never met before. You're going to see them for the first time. And uh, believe me, over a point of time, you will make friends for life. But at this point, there is going to be a chance that somebody is going to judge you. Uh, somebody is going to listen to what you're saying and um, make opinions based on that. So you have to be, uh, you have to have certain skills to be able to know that as well as take it in the right stride. And so this is where I'm coming from. I'm just going to close this. I'm going to stop sharing now. Yes. And um, we are going to move from there to beginning on what life skills we are going to discuss. So I have curated from, so you've seen the 2015, you've seen the trajectory that's moved up to 2021. And today I'm going to pick just five life skills because so the, I'm going to pick the top five that I think are really important. And I'm going to tell you what it takes to get there in detail because of the time positive, we will be able to do five today. Um, but uh, I think these are five critical. If you track them, then uh, you know the others will fall in place. So this is uh, where we are going to start talking about. The first one I have picked up for the day yeah, is um, curiosity. Now, this is something that a lot of people have um, 
organizations, you know, institutions say that amongst young adults, yeah, and why I'm telling you this is that because most of the times when you ask somebody who's heading the organization, whether it's a job-based organization or a university or anybody who's in that leadership position, uh, what are the things that are required? They come back and tell you things that they do not see in the audience now. That is missing. And they say, this is something that we feel is important and is missing, you know? So curiosity is one amongst them. And let me put a context to you. Uh, my guru, my mentor, my guide for my PhD program uh, is probably one of the most curious persons I have met. Yeah. And um, give me a moment. I'm very sorry, but I need to put my laptop on charging. Give me a second to do that. I'm very sorry. Uh, I think the context that Ms. Uh, uh, Professor Preeta is bringing in is something which is uh, uh, also pretty much embedded into, uh, you know, the curriculum, uh, what is, uh, uh, you know, taught at Flame University, the way it is done. And uh, again, uh, it's not about, uh, uh, you know, what you explore in life, but it is something how you question the question, how do you ask a correct question and, you know, that sort of a skill which I think helps you become a better learner. So uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. So uh, one of the things that I feel has happened here and uh, which could be the reason why uh, curiosity is not there anymore is because at an early age, we get exposed to uh, a lot of things. I'm talking about when I say us, you and me who are part of that privileged group, right? We were exposed to travel, so it's not like we are seeing places for the first time. We have seen new people, you know, people um, over a period of time in different contexts moved out of our city. All of us have at least traveled out of our city once. Um, um, have maybe some of you have traveled out of the country at least once, and uh, we have had access to different languages, different kinds of foods, and we know many things. So what this does to to us. Yeah, what does this do to us? One is that, yes, at a very young age, it broadens our perspective. We're able to see a lot more. But over a period of time, like when you're still young, when you're still 16, 17, and 18, you tell yourself that I already have seen the world. I know everything. I don't need to know anything more. Yeah, so this is one issue. Whereas if you look at the rags to riches stories, yeah, the ones who come from very, very humble beginnings, they come with the fact that I don't know anything. I want to explore. I want to know. How is this uh, person living in the city? What is city life like? What does it mean to earn money? What does it mean to have a different kind of a lifestyle? There is so much curiosity around everything. You know? I want to learn. That is a very, very strong sort of a, a need in the rags to riches. But if we identify that this is something that even we can have, yeah, as, as even the privilege, uh, we can have a very, very curious mind. Yeah, that, that is possible. So I was telling you about my PhD guide. He is uh, pushing 65 now, but when I knew him, he was uh, in his late 50s. And, um, you know, he had a hip bone fracture and a surgery which got him a slight limb. So you're imagining a kind of a old person yeah, who is um, kind of limping. But every day, this gentleman, he was in the marketing arena, marketing field, and he was my mentor. He would step out after 12 and he would walk around the streets of Chennai. That's where I, I'm from, IIT Madras. So we were in Chennai. He would walk through the streets to see how shopping happens there. You know, how are people bargaining? What is the kind of behavior that comes out of this? He would go to every a uh, high-end automobile launch. He'd say, I just came back from, uh, you know, uh, test driving the new BMW. He, he wore an FC UK watch. And uh, he, he had an extremely curious mind. He would want to learn about, so the moment there was Kindle launched, I remember he said, I'm going to buy the Kindle to see how it is. Yeah, and uh, with new products, whether, and, and with new technology, with 
all of that, you would not be able to kind of fit in this person with this sort of an age. So there's really no age. If somebody at that age can be curious, can be, uh, you know, uh, can be asking questions, saying that there could still be things that I don't know. Yeah? And uh, as a result, what happens is that this person then becomes your source of information. Even for technology, there are people who say, let's go to Sir and ask him what, what's his take on this new technology. Imagine. Yeah. So uh, usually we ask the kids, right? We ask youngsters. We say, okay, you teach us this new technology. And this person, because of his curiosity and his will for learning, has gained that. So this is one lesson I think that I imbibed from him. And I realized myself that we stop asking questions and that's not good. We should be curious. What curiosity does for you is A, it helps you make new friends because you talk to people and you break the ice. Two is that it always gives you additional information. And I have found that extremely useful. Sometimes there is uh, you know, information that you get that you may not find immediately useful. Like when I'm in a cab, I talk to the cab driver. I ask the cab driver how much he makes. Uh, I ask him what he does in his day, where he's going back. Does he have food with him? Does he stop somewhere and eat? I ask him many things. What was his past life like? And, you know, we have a conversation. What, how this helps me is that this is, an, this is the start of society that I am not part of. It gives me inroads into understanding their behavior which helps me in the behavioral studies, um, you know, projects that I work on. So uh, this is something that really is useful irrespective of whether you find any immediate use or not. So don't just ask questions when you have an immediate use, but ask questions to uh, feed this curiosity that you have. And so when they say you're mildly curious, yeah, so when somebody is mildly curious, you will, uh, age wisely. Yeah, this is this is a saying that if you're mildly curious, you will age wisely. But if you're greatly curious, you will be rejuvenated. Yeah, you will be rejuvenated. So you will not grow old at all because your mind is always ready for new information. It's picking it up. It's imbibing it. It's using it, and that really makes a difference. So definitely to the age, at this age group that you are in definitely you have to have a curious mind. Don't be afraid. Uh, there may still be some people who might judge you, who may say, oh, what a silly question that is. Sometimes it may happen, but please don't be afraid because a curious mind always goes further ahead than somebody who does not ask questions, yeah? So question asked is always better than not. So that's my first lesson and life skill to you, which is very, very important. And it's the most, it's the top most on my list. The second on my list is continuous learning. Now, what do we mean by this? Yeah. So what is the age when you say, I'm going to stop learning and I'm going to now start working? And when we start working, we think that everything that we do in that space is learning, right? You learn to meet friends, you learn to work in the systems that you, uh, you're uh, in, for example, there are some new software systems, you learn that. And then you learn, um, you know, other um, sort of things about their competitors, you learn. So you, you're in a space where you learn about things. When you come uh, to, uh, you know, to a university, you will learn about your friends, you will learn about the systems in place, oh, how is online teaching done? Yeah, uh, so this this is something that um, is, uh, is a life skill that is not supposed to be, you know, put a stop to at any point of time in the life. Why? Because we are in the VUCA world. When I say VUCA, it's volatile, it's quick, it's changing. And who would have thought yeah, um, two years ago that in a space like education, where teachers are so used to chalk and board, are so used to classroom. We are, uh, you know, we are the old age stand-ups, if you, if you may, uh, where we look at our audience, we see what they are, how they are reacting, and then we are able to deliver in an interactive manner a session. Now, who would have thought that somebody like that would have to go completely online 
many a times with zero visibility of who their audience is. Yeah, yeah many a times it's not possible to keep the screens on. And uh, in such a situation, teachers for one uh, you know, group of people have learned to, to adapt to teaching without knowing what the audience is thinking about them or about the topic or the subject. Have they learned, have they not learned? Uh, teachers have learned to evaluate online. So the whole evaluation pattern has changed. So right from education to something like, so in the service industry, if you look as education, there is, uh, luckily education was able to go online, but there are some other services that couldn't go online. For example, hotels. Yeah? The only way to experience a hotel is to go and stay in the hotel room. And because they were not able to adapt, to change, to, to, to respond to this new scenario that we are facing for the last one, one and a half years, they were out of business for about a year and a half. Uh, most hotels were out of business because they weren't able to learn the new ways and move on. Because this is a very physical sort of an exercise. Yeah? So whether it is uh, today, if you see there's data sciences, which is very important, there's machine learning, analytical skills, digital marketing, which incidentally Flame is very good, well known for. For the last six years, we have been winning a global competition in digital marketing. Uh, yeah, so whether all of these are there, this is the truth of today. Tomorrow it will be something else. Yeah, and after tomorrow it will be something else. So what you uh, need to do is, as, as in the life skill, so one is that, of course, you will learn a little more of data analysis, you will learn a little more of digital marketing, and you will learn a little more of machine learning. But the underlying skill that you need is to never stop learning. Continuous learning, no matter what age you are, no matter which profession you are in, no matter what skills you already have, unless you upgrade, there is no way that you can survive. So this is one very, very important um, skill, life skill that you have to learn to keep with. Yeah? And I was telling you about the rags to riches story. I'm going back there every time because I need to tell you why privileged people need to work harder. Yeah, privileged people need to work harder. You think that because you're privileged, you have everything in place, but you need to work harder than the underprivileged because for the underprivileged, it comes naturally. Whereas for the privileged, it does not come naturally. So here is the story of two sisters, Ankita Jain and Vaishali Jain. They are the All India rank number three and number 21 this year in the UPSC exam. Yeah, This is nothing short of commendable, but their story is not visible because their parents were not auto drivers. Yeah? So the moment you have come from an underprivileged setting, it becomes in the same family, two IAS officers, uh, young age. But if you look at the story, Ankita Jain's, uh, this was her fourth attempt. She had given three attempts already. She has worked in an organization and then she attempted first time. She did not clear second time. She cleared the uh, exam. She couldn't hear the interview. Third time again, you know, there was a roadblock. Fourth time she did it. So this is a story where, uh, you know, you don't have that much of a leeway to talk about, which is why I'm sharing it with you. It hasn't been shared as much. Yeah. Whereas if the same story came from somebody who was underprivileged, it would be a big bang story. Yeah? AIR three, number three, I mean, all India rank number three. Uh, is, is a big story and um, uh, we don't talk about it as much and two of them both sisters in the same house so um, you know amazing success but not talked about so the third thing that I'm going to talk to you today about or the third skill that I'm going to put to you which we um, all know don't do very well and don't know what to do about it right so I'm going to tell you how we are going to figure this out and how you're going to fix it. So the third skill is on communication and interpersonal skills. Since you are born, since childhood, you have been taught to communicate. You have been told what to say, what to do, how to, how to do things. But 
somehow as we grow up, we tend to take different paths where our interpersonal skills keep dropping. Or sometimes what happens is that you are an introvert and you say that I don't like to do this, so I don't want to do it. Yeah. Whereas in some other cases, you have to do it and then you are, you know, in stress. So the way to find out if you're an introvert or an extrovert is that not by the amount of conversations or uh, interpersonal, uh, you know, exercises or talks that you have in the day. It is based on how often it energizes you as against how often it tires you. So after a healthy talk with somebody else, maybe with a stranger or even sometimes with, uh, you know, uh, people you are acquainted to, you feel tired. You feel that I am tired today because I talked to people for two hours. Yeah. Then there's a good chance that you are an introvert. If you, after two hours of talking, say, I am energized. I am loving this. I had the best time ever. Then you are an extrovert. Yeah. So maybe in the chat box, Based on this definition, you can tell me if you are if you have you analyze yourself as an introvert or an extrovert because it makes all the difference in the world on how you have interpersonal communication skills. Yeah. So if you um, identify yourself as an introvert, somebody who feels tired after they have spoken to somebody to a stranger to on a topic that they are not very comfortable with, etc then you need to make sure that you find ways to overcome it. I mean, I'm helping you diagnose this and I'm helping you to tell you what, where you stand, but everybody has to communicate. Yeah. In the last one year, we were in a different situation, right? All the extroverts were getting choked because they were sitting in their houses. They couldn't meet friends. They couldn't meet family. They couldn't go out to work. And extroverts, and this is once again something that we don't usually acknowledge or recognize. An extrovert needs to chat, needs to talk, needs to be out there, needs to make friends and you know be in the move. They were going through serious issues because they were confined to a cage that we call our home. They were confined to it and they weren't allowed to meet people or talk to people. And these were the first people who started Zoom chats, yeah, who said, Let's meet on Zoom. Let's connect and let's chat. Whereas there was another group, the introvert, who was uncomfortable all this while, but happy now that they are in their homes and they don't need to talk to anybody. Right? Wow. So we have almost equal number of introverts and extroverts in this group. So I'm, I'm just glad that I helped you find where you are. But news to all of you, is that you have to be, uh, uh, you know, you have to be strong in interpersonal communication. Yeah, because there is no other way in which people will know you better. So maybe if you are, uh, you know, uh, talking to them more often, they will know that you are an introvert and you'd like your space once in a while. Even for that, you need to express this and you need to talk to people. Similarly, uh, let me give you a real life situation. These days, uh, we are only meeting on Zoom, right? Students are only meeting on Zoom. So my son moved from one school to the other just before COVID, right? And when he moved, he had no friends in the new school. And this current teaching situation is such that you can only make friends outside of the classroom. You can't make, you can't really make friends Unless you push somebody or you share your tiffin with somebody else or, uh, you know, you walk down the stairs together, you don't really share a bond um, the way you are in a classroom. It's a formal setting, so you, there is not enough space for this. So uh, what has happened for uh, my son is that he's not able to, therefore, you know, make friends, which is a very tough situation at this age. And all of his friends are from his old school from where you know he had made friends earlier. So communication is very, very important. Uh, once you recognize it, you have to start working on it. If you feel there are any lows that you are not able to manage, then this is the time to address it. 
treat it as seriously as a fracture. Yeah, if there is a fracture, you will go to the doctor, you will see what the next steps are and you will make sure that surgery is done. Treat it as seriously as that and work on it is something I want to tell you. Uh, if there are any questions, um, Anjuman, we can take them now. We, we are half an hour. Questions as of now. We don't have any questions. Yeah, okay. I, uh, so Lena is saying, I read news today, uh, Pune University getting permission to open. Yes, Lena. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, this will allow students to develop, uh, you know, curiosity, interpersonal relations and the other life skills that Pritha was just talking about. So, yes, yeah, sorry, it was not a question. Uh, Professor Pritha. Yeah, but that's the good news. It's a brilliant news. So very soon, all of you who are double vaccinated will be able to come on campus and um, may the good times begin. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Much awaited. True, true. Yeah, so um, the next thing, um, you know, when we talk about life skills, the fourth one that I have in my list, which again is a combination of the Forbes list as well as my own experience. So how my experience is because I've had, uh, you know, in the past played several roles, one definitely of a mentor for, uh, you know, students and for prospective students, sometimes for co-workers and, and so on and so forth. So largely from mentoring, I know what are the issues and where are people facing issues and what is, what is the demand of the current times so that's one place where it comes from. The second comes from interviews. Uh, I've been interviewing um, for admissions for the last 10 years or so. So it gives me access to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, touch points where um, we are trying to find a good fit. So that's another touch point where I get my information from where we are taking decisions on students and they are fit into any university. Uh, my third touch point is as an employer in some sense, because I work on consulting projects and when a project comes in, we need to hire people to work with us on consulting projects. So there again, we pay a lot of attention to what is important when we are hiring somebody. And uh, the fourth touch point, if I may say, is as a teacher. Yeah, so when we are in class and we are spending time with students, uh, we give them assignments. There are various kinds of interactive activities, um, you know, something that uses our mind. So in all of these cases, uh, there is a certain sort of a understanding of what is required. Yeah? So while I was telling you about both the, you know, life skill as well as technical skill, one important technical skill is critical thinking. Critical thinking is basically your ability to understand a problem and then to solve it in, a, in innovative ways. So I'm going to bring this up as the next topic. Critical thinking usually has two elements. One element is the um, technicality, the physical aspect of it, domain knowledge, which means when a problem comes to you, you should have the domain knowledge to understand what it is and be able to answer that. But more importantly, you also need a life skill of being able to convert complex problems into easy answers. So if you've heard of Indra Noe, Indra Noe is the, uh, she was the former CEO of PepsiCo in, in the US. Yeah, so not even in the Indian context, but in the US. Uh, she was a very, very strong sort of a influence across you know, both the continents in India as well as in the US as a female leader. And if you ask her how she came to this position or what was it that people look for in her, she would say, uh, you know, the skill I brought onto the table was that I was a problem solver. Whenever there were complex issues around me and everybody was pulling their hair out saying, how do we solve this? What can we do? And PepsiCo, you know, has been in that in, in that troublesome area for a long time. First, for the amount of pesticides they use. Second, for the kind of um, harm they cause to the environment around them. So there have always been public litigations against PepsiCo. 
the third is the amount of sugar they add to it and therefore it becomes a very unhealthy drink. So on health issues, on environment issues, on so many other, they have been, um, uh, you know, one of the largest creators of plastic waste because of the bottles. Yeah, so uh, these companies like PepsiCo and uh, Coca-Cola, etc., have always been, uh, you know, in the forefront of public litigation. And if you ask Indra Nui how she turned out to be such an important person in that organization, heading the organization for so many years, she says that people came to me because I could convert critical, complex problems into simple ways of understanding it and provide a solution for it. Yeah. So this skill, imagine, is so important yeah, at such a stage that it took her from being just a simple employee who had started off to the head of this organization. Yeah, today, she is at a position where she has retired. She's written her autobiography, which has just released. I'm sounding like an Indra, but I am an Indra Noe fan. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it says Life in Full, uh, which is her book. But then um, uh, the point I was trying to bring to you is that this critical skills of problem solving, that too in innovative ways. So again, uh, here when I say innovation, I mean creative thinking that works. Yeah, this is a simple definition, creative thinking that works. So it's not just thinking creatively, thinking out of the box, but it has to be a solution that will work in the market. Yeah, so that's innovation for you. So you have to be able to start doing this. And I'm going to run a simple exercise for you right now. Yeah, this is in uh, problem solving. I'm going to share my screen once again, where we are, where I'm going to take you to that uh, slide, which brings you the problem. Yeah, what we are going to do, if we're ready, is that we're going to run a small poll. And uh, the poll is the answer to this question. Yep. Yeah. So here is something, uh, it's, it's a technical sort of a problem, but a functional problem. These gears are turning in different directions. The first large gear you can see, they have shown the direction is clockwise. But uh, as they move down, they move in maybe clockwise, anti-clockwise. Your task here is to tell me the A, B, C, and D, which are marked in blue, which direction do they move in? Yeah. So you have to study the gears movement and determine which whether a is moving clockwise or anti-clockwise, and so on and so forth. B, C, and D. We are running a poll, so you don't have to actually, you can look at the answers before you uh, even try to solve it. Can we have the poll? So there are four options given there. You just have to pick one of those options. Yeah, we're just putting the poll. So these are your four options as you can see them, where A is counterclockwise, B is clockwise, C is counterclockwise, and D is clockwise, and so on and so forth. Very interesting. Uh I think exercise. And very interesting answers as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm watching the answers. And it's also changing. I mean, I can just see the, oh my God. How do you explain this? Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. This takes me right into the next. How much do we have? Just give a few more seconds. About 50% have participated. I'll probably run for another 10 seconds. Yeah, please yes. be encouraging everyone to use, uh, uh, please uh, submit the poll. 
it'll be very interesting discussion uh, you know going forward i'm sure Uh, Professor Preeta, you can see this uh, share, sharing the results right now. I can see it. I, I'm anyhow eyeballing the answers. So. Yeah, we've stopped the poll. Okay, great. Yeah. So what, um, so, you know, I learned two things quickly because, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's something about me where I ask, uh, when I ask a question, I'm not just listening. I'm also using the answer to structure my own thoughts around it. Yeah. So what I found was that, and which, because we have access to this data, I'm sure Anju also did, was that in the beginning, yeah, people who answered quickly, just pick one choice out of the four, hoping for a chance, chance win. And what do we say when we flip a coin? What happens when we flip a coin? is there's a 50% chance that it will be a heads or a tail. Yeah. Correct? And that's exactly what happened. We got 25% in all of them. In all the categories. That was yeah. surprising. I thought uh, it was some error, but then I just realized it was absolute clean division of all the four answers. Right. So this is what happens if you just pick a choice without actually trying to do this. You know, you're... Whereas when the uh, when people actually started trying to work this out, the ratio started changing. Yeah, the ratio yes. started changing. So this is uh, uh, you know this is going back to that um, uh, to the. I think the audience would want to know the correct answer. I think. Okay, the correct answer we can we can work it out together right here. So the first one is moving clockwise. Naturally, therefore the the. The second one will move anti-clockwise. The third will move clock. And the fourth, which is A, moves anti-clockwise. Yeah, it is counterclockwise. Then because A is moving counterclockwise, the next one will move clockwise. Now the trick is here that where it's going from uh, this one to the next one. So if I may use my cursor, it's moving both of them, because it's with a pulley, it moves, both of them move in the same direction. So this is clock, the big one with the pulley is also clock. Therefore, this uh, small one before B is anti-clock and B is clock. So it's anti-clockwise, clockwise, anti-clockwise, clockwise. So the first option answer A is as in, uh, the first option was the correct, was the correct answer. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, the idea was to really set you, um, you know, on a path for logical thinking, but um, it was also for you to understand the difference between logical thinking and critical thinking. In critical thinking, while you need some amount of logic, that's what I was trying to tell you, that you need some amount of logic. What you need is a larger understanding of the situation, a bird's eye view of the situation. And sometimes some people have this naturally. You know, you're born with it. There are some people who are able to do this easily and naturally. But let's say that you identify yourself as somebody who doesn't. Then critical thinking is something that you should start to, uh, you know, practice right from this age. Because it's a very, very essential skill for a lifetime. Whenever I've had problems, I've, uh, you know, so let me share some problems that uh, I may have had in my life that I tried to solve. So one of the issues that uh, was in my life was that we were moving from city to city to city. Yeah, We moved so many cities that they, we were like nomads. There was no one place that we could stay in. And it was causing some sort of a tension within me because I wanted to be in any one place. I couldn't care less which it was, but I wanted to settle down. Yeah, so this was a problem that I was facing and I was quite, um, it took up a lot of my mind space thinking how I could solve this and how I could, uh, you know, spend more time in one place and not have to do this. But the problem with our lives is that everything is not in our control. And uh, this is something that a privileged would face 
that for a long time in their lives, till they are with their parents, yeah, still you are with your parents, most things are under your control. What you eat, what you wear, which school you go to, who you make friends with, whether you choose to go to a party, where you want to go for your holiday, most things are under your control. When you want to sit down and study, when you want to go out and play, all this is under in your control. So what happens when you have to move out of this space and things go a little out of your control? You can't choose the things that you do. For the first time in my life, it happened after I got married. Yeah, I realized that many of my life decisions are not in my control and I'm not able to do things the way I would have done it. Given a choice, I would have done it like this. But those choices were taken out of my hand. But at the same time, I had to be in that situation. I couldn't say, I'm not going to be in this situation because I don't, I've lost control over how to make choices yeah, or how to decide. So what I did about this is I complained. <laughs> I made long faces. I cried. I tried all sorts of things in the beginning. Yeah, And this is how most of the times I think people, when you have to encounter change, we do. But the day I decided, yeah, so I hated, imagine I went from Bombay uh, to a place like Goa, which is like a dream destination for many people. Yeah, but I, I fought that. I fought it um, tooth and claw. Say, I don't want to make new friends with my neighbors. These are people I don't even know. They're strangers. I don't want to make friends. Yeah, I don't want to change my lifestyle. Because in Bombay, there was such great connectivity. In Goa, there's zero connectivity. If you don't have your own vehicle, it's so difficult, you know, to find a cab or to find a rickshaw to go from one place. So I said, I don't want to do this. And uh, that's where the problem was coming. So the moment I was able to solve this attitudinal problem, that I am going to go to a new city to explore, to learn, to have fun. Here's my opportunity to make new friends. Here's my opportunity to uh, cook new kinds of cuisines yeah, and uh, explore new places. It made all the difference. So this is something that we have to be, uh, which is the fourth point, and that is flexibility. You have to be flexible. The moment you say, this is my life and this is how it's going to be and I'm going to be rigid about it, it's going to be very, very difficult, especially in today's time when you are, there's so much ambiguity, right? Yesterday, we didn't know when the college would reopen, when the universities would open up. Today, we are at a stage we are saying, yay, let's open the gates. Let's welcome our students. Yeah, let's, let's see face, people face to face once again. So this is the kind of ambiguity we are living in. In 2021 itself, you're going to experience some things the way it was in 2020. Masks, maybe. Yeah, little bit of um, sanitation, maybe, because you have to still be careful. You're going to face some things like how it was in 2019, where you can still see people face to face, smile, walk beside each other, compliment on clothes, be casual. And most of the times, otherwise we are formal. And there is something that's going to be very 2021, yeah, which is neither what you experienced in 20 and neither what you experienced in 2019. So this change is something that you have to get comfortable with and learn to use to your advantage, which is something that I was saying that I did. Yeah, so to give you a quick recap of all the things that we have discussed. One moment. Yeah, so that's a quick recap of all the five uh, points that I brought to you from my own learning. One is curiosity, two is continuous learning, be it technical or life skill. Three is communication and interpersonal skills. Fourth is flexibility and comfort with ambiguity. The, and these are all, I, I might as well tell you, they map directly to what uh, companies and universities are looking in students in, uh, wh while they are moving careers. And finally is critical thinking. When you get a problem, how are you going to solve it in a way different? With that, I um, hand it over back to Anjul. <laughs> Yes, and thank you so much, Professor Pita. I think it was an amazing session. And uh, while, like I just uh, mentioned in the beginning, while people may take, you know, there's certain things that 
uh, people must learn and uh, the skills they must have, but they're just uh, very unfortunately left to ambiguity that they learn during this course of their life sometime with, the, with you know, harsh experience sometimes. Sometimes great experience, sometimes harsh experience. But I think with uh, uh, the very important fact that we're living in an age where information is so easily available, I think the most important thing is, I think a lot of people know about these uh, life skills. The important part is to actually go apply, start applying and have that attitude that, uh, you know, firstly accept yourself the way you are, who you are, but don't stop there. Just continuously uh, uh, set your own mini uh, targets where you can become a better person, a better person tomorrow than what who I was yesterday. And that's, I think, life. And uh, uh, thank you so much for this amazing session. And um, uh, we did speak about, uh, you know, all the elements uh, which are required uh, as part of the life skills uh, to succeed. And with the definition of succeed is something that who you decide what success is for yourself. Uh, I mean, to have done something nice, uh, which is a success, but it's not recognized, don't feel down low. I mean, it's still a success for you. People may not have celebrated. And uh, on the other hand, celebrate other people's uh, uh, successes because their backgrounds are different. Uh, and the world views a success uh, very through a very different lens, which was a new information for me today. So thank you so much, Professor Pritha Menon. And thank you students. And um, I know some of you were students and the others who uh, joined us for this connection series. Uh, and uh, we'll just sh share with you what our next series is going to be so that we can um, extend uh, invitation for that as well. So uh, you must definitely come in for the next session, which is uh, going to be talking about design of business. Very interesting. Uh, and the speaker is Mr. Shashank Deshpande, who is the managing partner uh, uh, at, at a very senior level. And uh, he's going to be making, uh, uh, you know, setting up the context of how design of business is, uh, you know, relevant in today's world and how it's changed over the period of time. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely evening and a beautiful Sunday tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pratham. Mm -hmm.